I sat completely still, feeling like I couldn't move. As my wife of 25 years explained why she was handing me divorce papers, I could only catch half of what she said. Alan, are you even listening? You seem lost. Sorry, I zoned out for a moment. What were you saying? The terms are straightforward. There's nothing to argue about. I'm not asking for anything. Got that? Absolutely nothing. You keep the house, cars, and all the money in the bank sign, and it's all done in three months. I was at a loss for words. Marcy and I had been married since high school. We raised our twin daughters, Cindy and Sandy, who went off to study at Columbia University. We had a comfortable home in the suburbs. Both drove Volvos, and Marcy had her own credit cards and phone. I never denied her anything, never cheated or mistreated her in any way. She never seemed unhappy or complained about anything. I never saw this coming. Maybe that was the problem. I wasn't paying enough attention. I get how divorce works, Marcy, but can you at least tell me why it might be too late to change anything? But I want to understand why. Marcy slumped into a kitchen chair. It was clear she didn't want to talk about it, hoping I'd just sign the papers and let her go. Just give me a quick answer, Marcy. What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, Alan. You were the perfect husband. Sometimes I wish you'd mess up so I'd have a reason to leave, but you never did. You did a great job raising the kids and getting them through college. You always gave me everything I asked for, even when I was being difficult. You got us a lovely house. My folks really like you. Don't ever think you did anything wrong because you didn't. She seemed to be about 45 years old. She had a nice complexion, and her light brown hair looked perfect, shining in the sunlight. She jogged often, keeping her body toned and tanned during the week. She dressed casually, but she could look glamorous when she wanted to. Marcy thought she was just as perfect as I was. Or at least, that's what she claimed. I couldn't figure out what was really going on. I'm sorry, but this doesn't make sense. There must be a reason. You can't just say it's okay and leave it at that. There has to be something behind it. Alan. I'm trying to handle this in a way that won't hurt your feelings or make me look bad. Let's just leave it at that. No, Alan, I found someone else. He's a real estate developer with a gorgeous apartment overlooking the river and a stunning black Mercedes. He's good-looking, wealthy, and totally in love with me. You've always been and still are. A clerk at the grocery store. I'm not putting down your job because you've always provided for us and made enough to keep the family comfortable. But you'll always be a clerk. I wanted more than that. I never thought you'd change for me. You were content with what you were doing, and I didn't see you striving for more. It hurt. Even though I was the manager of the grocery department. She still saw me as just a clerk when I had the chance to advance my career and move away. I turned it down to keep our family together and look at how that turned out. It was painful, but I didn't think it was worth mentioning. Does this rich, handsome guy have a name? Clayton Manning. He's the president of Keystone Development Company. How long have you known him? Six months. Did you sleep with him? Marcy sat up straight in her chair. Her eyes darted around the room. Then she looked me in the eye. Yes, I was trying to avoid the subject, but since you insist, yes, we were still married. Yes, I was still married. I cheated on you. I was unfaithful. I was. Are you satisfied now? I sat there for a moment then reached for the divorce papers, signed them in three places, initialed two and handed them to her across the table. I think he's better suited for you. Sorry to disappoint. I got up and as I left the room, Marcy yelled, No, that's not the reason. He wasn't better than you. Just different. Don't you dare believe that, Alan. Don't you dare. By then, I was out the door. I was so focused on my work and hobbies that I didn't even notice Marcy gradually moving her things out of the house. By the time she handed me the papers... She had already moved most of her clothes and personal belongings to Clayton's apartment. She thoughtfully left behind all the wedding and family photos so I could enjoy them while she was gone. When I returned home, she was nowhere to be found. Her Volvo was still in the driveway, and I figured she wouldn't need it anymore. On the kitchen table, she left a power of attorney to sell the house and car. I spent the rest of the night getting rid of the beer in the refrigerator. By then, I realized the deed was done. There was no turning back, and I didn't want to anyway. Marcy was gone and would be gone the next morning. I called work and took three months of overdue vacation. They had been nagging me to take time off, so there was no problem. I had plenty of vacation and sick leave. I quickly called the girls at school and briefly explained that we were splitting up, but refused to give them any more details. 
They wanted to call Marcy, but I didn't have her new phone number. I had three months to get myself together and figure out what I was going to do. I disconnected my landline, changed my cell phone number, and canceled the one Marcy had. The Volvo dealer gave me the low book value of Marcy's car. I had a high school friend, Terry, who is now a real estate broker. He agreed to sell the house without listing it at a low price, and with a quick settlement. To be safe, I canceled all my credit cards and opened new bank accounts. I cashed in my life insurance policies. It was time to get things in order. I went through the house and gathered everything that might belong to my wife. There was enough stuff to fill three trash bags. I packed the girls' personal belongings into boxes and put them in the closet next to the house. I spent three hours sorting through family photos. I put all the girls' pictures in a box for them. All of Marcy's pictures went in the trash can. It might have been foolish, but I didn't care. The main issue I faced was a lack of direction. I had no idea what I would do after three months. Would I stay here or leave? Would I keep working or find something new? I had two hobbies. I mostly collected coins, especially those with an Indian head on them. They were easy to collect and readily available. I bought and sold them on eBay and enjoyed it. My other passion was geocaching. It gave me an excuse to get outside and get some exercise. Marcy hated this activity because of ticks, poison, ivy, and having to walk. I didn't see how I could make a living doing any of these activities. When I wasn't busy with my hobbies, I spent time with the Wall Street Journal. Cindy and Sandy gave me a subscription every year for Christmas. I wasn't interested in stocks and bonds, but I read everything about farm commodities. I knew more about sugar, wheat, and corn than most market analysts. Of course, it was just a hobby. I didn't have any money invested in it. I researched all available information about Keystone Development and Clayton Manning. Terry Davis managed to dig up more info about Clayton and his latest project than I ever could. He dug into some details with a buddy of his at a local bank. I couldn't wait to see what he found out. It had been weeks, and during all that time there was no sign of Marcy. The girls called every week, but I hadn't heard from their mom either. I felt like they were on my side. But Marcy was still their mom, so I'm sure they had to show some support. I had a few yard sales and got rid of a bunch of stuff. I left enough furniture in the house so it still looked good for potential buyers. Marcy and Clayton's picture popped up in the society section of the Sunday paper. They were at some political rally, sipping wine with local big shots. A couple more weeks went by. Terry made me a lowball offer on the house. It was way less than the appraisal, but they wanted to close the deal in 60 days, which suited me just fine. He had some interesting dirt on Clayton and wanted to chat about it. We set up a lunch meeting. I figured I needed to get out of the house for a bit. I could use a breather. Hayes Mountain was one of the prime spots around here for hiking and geocaching. Unfortunately, I'd already found all the geocaches there, but there were three landmarks up on the mountain. Landmarks are these points scattered all over the country that surveyors and real estate folks use to figure out property lines. They're usually metal rods stuck in concrete. Finding landmarks is like a bonus game for hardcore geocachiers. Today I decided I was going to track down all three landmarks on the mountain. And besides my GPS, I'd have to bring along a metal detector. Spotting a piece of rebar in the woods isn't exactly a walk in the park, so I could use all the help I could get. The GPS would guide me close enough to the spot. Hayes Mountain was a big chunk of land, almost 2,000 acres, and most of it belonged to the Madison Land Trust. They were always trying to expand it. But with subdivisions and industrial parks gobbling up the open space, they relied on donations to keep going next to the Trust's parking area. There was this orchard and farmhouse up for sale with a big sign out front. Once I parked, I strolled over to the fence by the orchard just to take a peek. It felt kind of sad to think this beautiful place might soon be plowed under for development. Are you thinking of buying it or just admiring the view? Came a voice from behind. I turned to see an old man approaching, wearing overalls and a John Deere cap. I chuckled. If I had a million bucks, I'd snatch it up in a heartbeat, I replied. He grinned back. You reckon you'll have any trouble selling it? He asked. Well, I've got some folks interested, but I'm holding out as long as I can, he replied. Why is that? I asked. I was hoping the land trusts would scoop it up, but they're short on cash. They want to keep the fruit trees as is, but the developers want to bulldoze everything. I think it'd be a real asset to the area, I said. But how can the trust compete with those big companies? He explained. 
I've offered them a sweet deal, even though it's listed for a million. I'm willing to let them have it for $600,000, but they can't seem to rustle up the cash in time. If they can't, then that darn real estate guy gets his hands on it, he grumbled. He's been hounding me every week. An option isn't a done deal, is it? I asked. Nope. He said he pays $100,000 for the option to buy it later for a million. If he can't cough up the cash, he loses that money. It's a good deal for me, but I don't want him to win, he added. He's got the dough locked up, so he's safe. Problem is, he needs all six properties for the deal to work. That's why he's offering more than it's worth. What if you don't sell him the option? I inquired. He'll be in deep trouble. The old man chuckled. If he doesn't get that lot, the whole deal falls apart and he loses everything. He's invested maybe a million bucks. His backers will bail and you'll be left high and dry. I'd help you out if I could, I said sympathetically. Sure thing, he replied, sounding a bit resigned. They all say that. We shared another laugh and I set off on my walk. His mention of Keystone piqued my interest. The landmarks were about a mile apart, at least if you were a bird flying straight, but on the mountain it felt more like two miles. Finding the first two markers was a breeze. They were your typical surveyor's markers, but the third one, that was a different story. It was older, tougher to locate, buried under years of forest debris. When I finally stumbled upon it, I discovered a small brick monument with a bronze plaque attached. It was hidden beneath layers of leaves and dirt. I snapped a picture thinking it might be worth sharing in a magazine. And then everything changed. As I moved away from the marker, my metal detector started beeping. It was faint, but it was definitely there. I slipped on my headphones and started scanning the area nearby. After a bit of poking around, I unearthed a small iron box wrapped in oil-soaked canvas. It was rusty, but sturdy with a heavy bronze lock. Normally, finds like this on public land are considered treasures and turned over to the authorities. But for some reason, that didn't feel right to me. So I tucked the box into my bag and headed home. On the way back, I couldn't stop wondering about the contents of my little discovery. Gold coins, historic documents from the Civil War. The possibilities were endless, limited only by the size of the container. Back at home, I cleared off the kitchen table and carefully examined my find. I didn't want to damage the lock, but I couldn't see any other way in. So I reluctantly decided to sacrifice it with my bolt cutter. Inside the box, I found another layer of oiled canvas, and beneath it, a dozen pennies. But these weren't just any pennies. They were large cents dating back as far as 1793. Surprisingly, they were in remarkably good condition with no green corrosion. I never really collected large cents myself, preferring Indian head pennies for their value. However, I remembered a book my grandfather left me titled The Quirks of the Penny, which delved into the different types and varieties of large cents. I found the book boring because I didn't own any of the coins. It talked about. It had been sitting untouched on my shelf for nearly 30 years, but tonight it was going to finally serve a purpose. I stayed up until the crack of dawn, poring over the pages with my grandfather's book and a magnifying glass using my scanner. I snapped detailed high-resolution photos of each coin. Every tiny imperfection on the stamps was crystal clear, and the condition of each coin was evident. I slept in until noon feeling refreshed, but eager to see how things were going at work. When I called, they mentioned that Phil Williams, one of the company bigwigs, had inquired about me, but I had bigger fish to fry, so I didn't dwell on it. Getting a safe deposit box from the bank was the next step. After spending hours researching online, I was floored to discover that my pennies were worth several million dollars, not just because of their age, but because of their condition and stamp varieties. It made me realize why criminals went to such lengths to launder money. Turning my coins into cash wouldn't be a walk in the park. Over breakfast at IHOP, I spotted another picture in the paper of Marcy and Clayton at an art gallery opening. That's when the next move clicked in my mind. Once the safe arrived, I reached out to John Smart and asked him to hold off on any decisions about the land for a few days. He seemed content with the request. Then I swung by the land trust office to inquire about making a donation. They were thrilled to assist me with the final divorce just four weeks away. I felt a sense of urgency. The rest of the day was spent researching coin dealers and auction houses, looking for any signs of trouble. 
Eventually, I settled on Towers and Burns in New York City. They seemed capable of handling controversial sales discreetly. I scheduled an appointment with them for Monday afternoon to round out the day. I called the girls and arranged to have lunch together on Monday morning, keeping the morning free when I arrived at Towers and Burns. I was struck by the modern, elegant showroom. After giving my name, I was escorted to a less glamorous part of the building. Welcome to New York, Mr. Simmons. I hear you've got some intriguing coins to show us. Is this your first time visiting the city? I took a seat in the chair opposite James Towers. His face was familiar from the ads, but he seemed a bit older now. Thanks. My daughters go to Columbia University, so I've been here before, but never on business. I'm not doubting your knowledge of coins, but do you have someone on your team who's an expert in early copper coins? It might be helpful to have them here. I'm not too touchy about it, and I think that's a great idea. He leaned over to the intercom on his desk. Murray, can you have Cookson come into my office? Maurice Cookson, who had authored several guides on large cents and half cents, soon entered. He looked older than his photos. But then again, who doesn't mind looking younger? I have 12 special coins I'm looking to sell today. I hope to sell four and keep the fifth for your consideration. The others I'll hold on to for now. If today goes well, I'll offer those to you as well. I know it sounds incredible, but I believe six of them will fall under conditional census status. Mr. Cookson can confirm if I'm right or not. Since coins like these don't come up for sale often, I thought you might be interested. Where did these coins come from? James asked. They were passed down to me by my grandfather when he passed away. Not to cast doubt, Mr. Simmons, but the story is a bit hard to believe. Can you show us what you got? I laid out four photos on the table, each displaying both sides of one of the coins I was offering today. They were enlarged about five times their actual size and crystal clear. James and Morris examined each photo carefully for several minutes. So, what's your asking price for these four? James inquired. A quick glance at recent auctions suggests I could fetch about $1.3 million for them. I initially thought $1 million, but your figure isn't out of the realm of possibility. Morris really knows his stuff when it comes to pennies, James remarked. I'm willing to offer $800,000 for the lot, but under one condition. What kind of condition are we talking about? I asked. I have a special letter from the Land Trust about donating land. I'd like you to take a look at it along with an advertisement for John Smart's Orchard, I said, handing them over. I'd like you to buy this plot of land and donate it to the Madison Land Trust. The price is $600,000. You'll score a hefty tax deduction and earn some serious karma points. Give us a sec, please, James said, motioning to Morris. They huddled at the far end of the room, deep in conversation, and after a few minutes, Morris stepped out and James returned to the table. Got any coins on you? He asked. Yep, and I've got a fifth one I'd like to keep in the mix, I replied. Mr. Cookson reappeared with a purple crown royal bag. We're willing to honor your terms on the land deal and hope you'll do the same on the coin deal, he said, dumping the bag's contents onto the table. It was a treasure trove of nearly 100 coins, mostly gold, with some silver mixed in the retail value of this collection is around $300,000. James explained, For various reasons, we've had trouble selling them, but you shouldn't have any issues. You've sold coins on eBay before, right? I nodded. Your grandfather's coins should fly off the shelves and we'll both come out ahead, James said with a wink. After some thought, I agreed. I handed over the four pennies to Mr. Towers and we sealed the deal with handshakes all around. Now, Mr. Simmons, tell us about this fifth coin, James prompted. I held up the photo and described it as the top-rated 1793 strawberry coin I'd ever seen. I rated it an eight, but I'm no expert. I added both James and Maurice leaned in, eager to see the photo. Morris had a big grin and James had a twinkle in his eye. How much? James asked. Best offer. As long as you can figure out how to pay me, I replied. Would you like some coffee, Mr. Simmons? Letitia, an absolutely stunning woman, asked as she entered the room. Sure, black's fine, I replied. They left the room at about 30 minutes later. James returned with Letitia. Hello, I'm Letitia Rothberg. Do you have a passport, Mr. Simmons? She asked in a deep yet feminine voice. Yes, I do, I replied. Good. We'll head to JFK shortly to set up a new offshore bank account for you. Do you have anything for Mr. Towers? She continued. I handed over the 1793 strawberry, and James practically lit up with excitement. Thank you, 
thank you, he exclaimed as he left the room. We never settled on a price, but Towers was keen on those seven coins. Mr. Towers agreed to hang on to the small bag of coins until I got back, and before I knew it, Letitia and I were seated on a plane bound for the Cayman Islands. She didn't say much during the flight. When we landed, photographers were clamoring to snap her picture. She seemed both irritated and amused by the attention. I was clueless as to why she was such a celebrity. It was my first time flying first class, and it was over, in a flash. A bright yellow mini SUV awaited us at the terminal. Letitia wasted no time hopping into the driver's seat. Flashing her tanned legs in the process, I couldn't help stealing glances, feeling a bit flustered. She seemed to find my discomfort amusing. Twenty minutes later, we arrived at a mid-sized condo building. Letitia owned the entire building but used the top floor as her personal space. Care for anything, Mr. Simmons? She asked as she left the room. Watching her leave was just as captivating as seeing her foot in the terminal. I'm not one to gush over women, but Letitia Rothberg was captivating. We stepped onto a small balcony overlooking the ocean. It was stunning, but the wind was a bit much for my liking. She was probably trying to impress me with the luxurious surroundings, but my mind was more on the new bank account. You're not much of a talker, Mr. Simmons. Don't you have any questions? She asked. It strikes me as odd that someone of your stature would drink beer from a bottle, I remarked. I'd imagine you sipping champagne or martinis instead. I usually think it's best to wait. But I suppose you could tell me why we had to come here to open a bank account, I added. It's a simple, secure place to stash your cash. I think it'll serve you well, she replied. You've got seven more coins after all. That still seems like overkill. I admitted to my relief we headed back indoors, away from the wind. Can you handle this? Letitia suddenly asked, catching me off guard. I brought you here to be myself for a few days. Her unexpected comment brought a smile to my face. I knew she was joking, but it was a humorous moment nonetheless. She had a great sense of humor, looked stunning, and had a fortune to boot. What more could a guy ask for? If only I were a decade younger. Teasing an old man won't do any good, I joked, and we both chuckled at the situation. Come on, Mr. Simmons, let's go grab some fresh lobsters for dinner, she suggested and we downed the last of our long necks before heading out the door. The restaurant was fantastic, but the wine the hostess picked didn't sit well with me. I tried to be polite about it, but my discomfort must have been obvious. What's the matter with the wine, Mr. Simmons? She asked. I'm sorry, it's just a reflex. When I was 18, I got sick on cheap white wine, and ever since the smell or taste of it makes me nauseous, I explained. But don't worry about it, it's good wine. A few minutes later, we had two fresh, long necks. Strangely, there wasn't much conversation during the meal at the end. We each had a slice of key lime pie and sipped on coffee. So, tell me about yourself. Are you married? Any kids? What do you do for a living? She inquired, eager to learn more about me. We've got all night and I'm curious about how we ended up here, she added. That's a lot of questions. I chuckled. I have two daughters, both studying something in international banking at Columbia University. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure what they're studying. I just foot the bill. That's fascinating. I actually have a master's degree from Columbia and occasionally lecture there. I've met both of my daughters. I continued. Did you see them this morning? She asked. We had lunch together. They're not too thrilled when I make them skip class, I replied with a smile. You must have tied the knot early if you've got two daughters in college she observed. Yeah, it does sound like a line from a movie. I chuckled. I felt at ease with this Mediterranean beauty. I could have talked to her for hours. As for me, I'm currently separated from my wife. It's a strange word to use. I admitted she left me for some rich wheeler dealer. He's probably into building shopping malls or business complexes, given his fancy car and big apartment. She said she's decided to move on and the divorce should be finalized in about four weeks. That's a flimsy excuse to end a good marriage, she remarked sympathetically. Yeah, I thought everything was fine until she met this guy. I guess she was never happy with my career choice. I reflected. I had chances to move up, but she didn't want to budge. I wasn't thrilled about it. But I thought it was necessary to save the marriage. Now I just feel empty. And what about you? I asked, turning the spotlight back on her. There was a moment of silence. How do you tell a beautiful, wealthy, successful woman that you manage a grocery store? She noticed my unease and responded accordingly, saying, 
It's not a big deal. We can chat about it later. No, it's fine. I'm not embarrassed about what I do, I assured her. It's just that being a grocery manager at a supermarket isn't exactly a glamorous job that impresses the ladies. My daughters don't mind, but my wife often conveniently forgot to mention it in conversations. I could tell it bothered her. Do you enjoy your work? She asked. Yeah, I do. And I'm pretty good at it. I replied as the server brought more coffee and cleared the table. Mr. Simmons, I know we've only just met, but I believe first impressions are important. So what's your first impression of me? She inquired. Her question put me in a bit of a tight spot. If I told her what I really thought, I might push her away. But if I tried to flatter her, she'd see right through it and think I was insincere. What should I do? In short, I see you as beautiful, intelligent, educated, and self-assured. I said, noticing a slight smirk on her face as she tilted her head down and looked up at me. I was hoping for honesty, she admitted. I'm sorry, but we were having such a nice evening. I didn't want to spoil it. I apologized. Do you really have such a low opinion of me? She questioned her tone, turning serious. Maybe that's why your wife left you for another man. If you hadn't always tried to please her, your marriage would have been stronger. Her words stung. But I had to admit there was some truth to them. You use your beauty and charm to get what you want. You're accustomed to getting your way, and I sense a bit of a spoiled attitude. You toy with men but fear, commitment. Yet you seem savvy with money, knowing how to spend and invest wisely. If you weren't so focused on proving yourself equal to any man, you might actually make a good mother. I said feeling uneasy, but also a bit irritated by her earlier remark about my marriage. For a moment, we just sat there silently, staring at each other. Do you really think I'd be a good mother? She asked, her tone softening. Suddenly, the tension eased and the mood lightened. As we drove back to the condo, my night is Letitia Rothberg. Supposed bed slave turned out to be rather dull. It's hard to get intimate when you're in separate bedrooms, but that was fine by me because I wasn't expecting anything anyway. The next morning, I woke up to find a breakfast spread of fruit, pastries, and hot coffee waiting for me, along with a copy of the Wall Street Journal. The wind had died down, and I enjoyed a relaxing moment on the balcony overlooking the Caribbean. I could definitely get used to this. About twenty minutes later, Letitia joined me, playfully snatching part of the newspaper as she settled in. We sat there, quietly absorbed in our reading and enjoying our coffee as if it were a routine we'd been doing for ages. Despite only knowing her for less than a day, everything felt so natural and easy with her. I'm sorry. My phone doesn't seem to be working here and I really want to call my daughters, I mentioned without hesitation. Letitia offered me her cell phone. Go ahead, it's all yours. Hey, Cindy, it's Dad. Where are you? Is everything all right? I asked anxiously. The cell phone showed London as her location. Dad, I'm in the Cayman Islands and everything's fine. I'm just staying with a friend. Had to borrow her phone to call you since mine's acting up. Cindy explained. They showed a picture of you on TV last night getting on a plane with Letitia Rothberg. What's going on? I pressed. That's the friend I mentioned. What's the big deal? Cindy responded. Why are you with her? You need to be careful, Cindy. Letitia Rothberg is a shark. She's ruthless. I warned her as Letitia walked by with the tray of breakfast from the balcony. I introduced her. This is Cindy, my daughter. She's in New York. Cindy heard me mention Letitia's name and let out a groan over the phone. I could hear her and her sister Sandy discussing something quickly on the other end. Why are you there? How do you know her? What? Are you coming home? Cindy bombarded me with questions before I could respond. Letitia was already reaching out for the phone. Hi, Cindy. It's Letitia. Your dad told me about you and your sister. I'll be in New York tomorrow and would love to have lunch with both of you. Where should I pick you up? Of course. I couldn't hear Cindy's response from my end of the conversation. All right, Cindy. Talk to you later. Bye, Letitia said, handing me back my cell phone. Your daughter said goodbye. Looks like we're having lunch tomorrow. I'll be on my best behavior, even if they think I'm a shark. She chuckled, heading to her room. An hour later, we found ourselves at the Federal Reserve Bank of the Cayman Islands with Letitia as guidance. I set up my first offshore bank account 20 minutes later. I saw that my new account had been credited with $4 million from Towers and Burns. It seemed like a fair price for 215 pennies. After our meal, she arranged for a friend to take us to feed manta rays over dinner. 
I inquired about her job at Towers and Burns and discovered she actually owns 60% of the company. So what else can you tell me about yourself? I prodded, feeling a bit embarrassed about my lack of knowledge regarding her. I was born and raised in London. My dad's Syrian and my mom's Turkish. I hold an MBA from Columbia University. Relationship-wise, I've been engaged twice but haven't been in anything serious for over three years. I've learned not to trust men who show interest in me. Call it cynicism, but I often feel like they have ulterior motives, she shared. That's unfortunate, I responded, feeling a pang of sympathy. I was hoping for a ride back to the condo. Does that mean you don't trust me? You big jerk, she teased. I'm sorry if I seemed insensitive. I didn't mean to. It's just hard for me to relate. I apologized, feeling a bit sheepish. All right, let's just relax. We have a party to attend. She changed the subject, steering the conversation towards lighter topics. Later that evening, we found ourselves at a cocktail party in a prestigious hotel. She was the center of attention, everyone treating her like royalty. I, on the other hand, tried my best to blend into the background, feeling out of place in my New York street clothes. Initially, Letitia felt obligated to stick by my side, but I encouraged her to enjoy herself and let me fade into the scenery where I felt more at ease. However, she kept checking on me throughout the night. I ended up engaging in conversation with a couple of Hispanic gentlemen, cattle ranchers from Argentina. Our discussion started with soccer and eventually veered into fishing. Despite my limited knowledge on the subjects, I tried to keep up, mostly nodding and smiling along. Then the topic shifted to investments. When Ramon York brought up his interest in winter wheat, I listened intently as he explained his investment plans. Although I couldn't help but wonder how someone with his apparent wealth could invest in something he seemed to know so little about. My poker face slipped, revealing my confusion. Mr. Simmons, your expression tells me you're not on board with the winter wheat investment idea, Ramon observed, catching me off guard. My attempt to remain unnoticed had failed miserably. I apologize, Ramon. I'm not really savvy when it comes to investing, and this topic is a bit beyond my expertise. I admitted opting for a casual first-name basis to ease my discomfort, but I have a feeling you've got some thoughts on the matter, Ramon persisted, trapping me into sharing my opinion. Feeling cornered, I mustered a weak smile. I think I need another drink. I deflected, buying myself some time. For the next hour, I listened as an Alabama greengrocer elaborated on the promising winter wheat crop in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Countering the poor harvest in the States, his explanation was thorough, but my mind struggled to keep up with the complexities of the discussion. Just when I was running out of witty remarks, Letitia came to my rescue, whisking me away from the intense conversation. As we walked off, she questioned me about the unexpected turn of events. What was that all about, Alan? We were just chatting about food, groceries, she remarked with a hint of amusement, flashing a small smile in my direction. The following morning, we flew back to New York, where a swarm of photographers awaited Letitia arrival. A courier from Towers and Burns handed me a package containing the coins I had left behind. After bidding Letitia farewell, I made my way to the commuter train terminal, headed back to Huntsville. The divorce proceedings and the sale of the house unfolded according to plan. Phil Williams from the main office had left me multiple messages, urging me to consider relocating to the company's headquarters in New York. This time I acquiesced. John Smothered also reached out, requesting a lunch meeting at work. I tucked myself away in my locker. Bidding my colleagues farewell as I prepared for my impending move to a newspaper photo caught my eye depicting Clayton and Marcy at a local politician's barbecue, appearing every bit the ideal couple. With three weeks remaining, I devoted a full day to scanning and identifying the coins from the bag I brought back from New York. Determined to make the most of them, I decided to list them on eBay at the earliest opportunity, as long as they didn't run into any sleazy characters. Everything should be fine. It took me a whole day to get those coin ads up and ready, along with all the envelopes and labels for shipping, all the cash flowed into my PayPal account, and from there, it was off to my new offshore bank. With the weekend ahead, I finally had some time to unwind. My Friday lunch with John Simard was quite something. He seemed thrilled that Clayton got involved, but wasn't too pleased that I didn't get anything out of the deal. Trying to explain it to him would have been a real headache. Lunch went smoothly, 
and as he was leaving, he handed me the deeds to five acres of land on the outskirts of town. Seems like good deeds do get rewarded. Not long after parting ways with John, my cell phone buzzed. Cindy and Sandy were touching down in Nashville in a couple of hours, giving me plenty of time to pick them up. They opted for Nashville because the airfare was way cheaper than flying into Huntsville, and they were watching their wallets. It was a breeze getting there and scooping them up. Cindy couldn't wait to gab about LSH. The lecture hall was packed with over 300 students for an advanced corporate finance course. Mid-lecture, the professor paused to introduce Letitia to the class, and she strutted in like she owned the joint. After addressing the class for about 10 minutes, she invited two students to lunch at the Western Hotel. You can imagine our shock when she called out our names. So you guys liked her? I asked as we hit the road. She's incredible, Dad. How on earth did you manage to meet her? Cindy blurted out, incredulous. Well, she mentioned she was in the market for a personal assistant, and I guess I fit the bill, I quipped, earning a nudge from Sandy. That's not funny, Dad. Get serious, she chided. All right, what did you guys talk about over lunch? I inquired, steering the conversation back. She was curious about our classes and coursework. Sandy replied with a slight chuckle, and she had a ton of questions about you. We both got the feeling she's interested in more than just being friends, Cindy added with a sly grin. But why you, Dad? She could have her pick of any guy, Sandy pondered, furrowing her brows. Yeah, think about it. From where we stand, you're a catch. But Letitia Rothberg doesn't know you like we do, remember? Even Mom didn't seem to know you that well. Cindy chimed in, her tone turning serious. The air between us grew heavy after my unintentional jab about their mother. I hadn't meant to sour the mood or turn them against her. I apologized, feeling the weight of my words. Settle in. Your mom's a gem and I shouldn't have said that. Don't sweat it, Dad. We get it more than you realize. Cindy reassured me with a gentle smile. We rode in silence for a bit until just as we crossed over into Alabama. Sandy's phone lit up with a call. Hey, yeah, we got here about an hour back. Good. No way. That's awesome news. I'll pass it along. Thanks for the heads up. Catch you later. Bye, Sandy said, ending the call with a grin, glancing in the rearview mirror. I caught Sandy giving Cindy a thumbs up. What's that about? I asked, curious, leaning over the front seat. Sandy spilled the beans. Guess what, Daddy? Letitia is heading to Huntsville. Tuesday morning, she expects you to foot the bill for the night and serve up breakfast in bed, she exclaimed. I was flattered by the news, but also felt the pressure from Letitia and now my daughters. It all sounded fantastic, and I hoped I was up for the challenge, not just for this one thing. The weekend with the girls went smoothly. They spent Saturday afternoon with their mom. But Clayton was a no-show. I asked them to keep mom about Letitia. We sorted through all the stuff they wanted to leave at the house, and by the time they left, everything was squared away. I made a promise on the drive back to Nashville. They made me swear to try to get along with Letitia when I asked what they meant. Cindy chimed in, Just don't take her off. Simple enough. They were jazzed about my move to town, but I still couldn't wrap my head around what Letitia wanted from an old guy who didn't even own in our money suit. Back home... I kicked back with a beer in the Sunday paper. No snapshots of Marcy and Clayton this week, but there was a blurb about Keystone Development hitting a snag with local financing. Winter wheat futures were taking a nosedive in value, which piqued my interest. I rang up Terry Davis and invited him over. It wasn't a fancy lunch, but a couple of cold ones and a chat would do the trick. Clayton Manning had a checkered past, to say the least. He'd been on a roller coaster ride of wealth and debt, dodging creditors and pals who lent him cash. His latest project was going belly up, and folks who backed him were vanishing into thin air. I don't think beer ever tasted so sweet. Monday morning turned out better than expected. The coins I put up for auction fetched a better price than I had imagined. The appraiser pegged the coins worth at around $300,000. They didn't seem like they'd fetch that much, but they might easily have reached over $200,000 in just a tad over two weeks. I'll be a free bird if you asked me three months ago. I'd have thought it was a nightmare, but today I'm eagerly anticipating it. The folks buying the house had hammered out the financing and were set to seal the deal. It struck me as funny how comfy Marcy felt with Clayton that she didn't need any of our shared stuff. I wondered if she'd grasp how uncertain her future was. At three... I had a sit-down with the buyers of the house. 
A fat $200,000 check went straight into my offshore account. They had no qualms about me crashing in the house for another week. Worked out for both of us. The next morning, I got a call before I even had my morning Joe. An unknown caller officially informed me that Miss Rothberg would be touching down at 10.45 a.m. on Delta Flight 724. I arrived 30 minutes early, feeling a tad jittery. Some paparazzi had caught wind of her arrival and were camping outside the terminal. I tried my darndest to lay low. I parked in short-term parking, not expecting all this hoopla. Instead of waiting for me to fetch her, she opted to walk alongside me behind the car. Naturally, the photographers clocked my license plate and the cat was out of the bag. I'm not used to all this hubbub, but Letitia seemed unfazed by it. She even apologized to me for it. On our way home, I couldn't help but recall how, as she stepped off the plane, I had the urge to plant one on her silly old man. I felt sheepish about the emptiness of the house over the past few months. I'd gotten rid of everything I could. The only things left were the essentials that the new owner had agreed to take over. Once I split, my guests found my attempts to apologize amusing. There wasn't a crumb in the house, so we swung by Taco Bell for a quick bite for her choice. I promised her some Dreamland ribs for dinner. It was refreshing to be around a woman with a hearty appetite. Letitia, I'm glad you're here, but I'm a bit confused why I confessed. I figured you'd be back to your usual grind. This is business, silly, she replied with a chuckle. I heard you're moving to New York next week. You'll need a place to crash, and I've got a spare room. I'm here to help you pack. A moving truck will swing by tomorrow morning to haul anything you can't fit in the car. Just no furniture, please. How did you find out? I was moving? I asked, genuinely surprised. That's just my thing, she replied casually. I pay attention to the small stuff, and the big stuff usually falls into place. Sounds like a bunch of baloney, I said, trying to sound playful. Are you in cahoots with my daughters or something? I attempted to flash an innocent grin, but let's be real. It's tough for an old guy like me to look sneaky. Her offer caught me off guard, but I couldn't come up with a single reason to turn it down. Sure thing, let's grab some boxes and start packing. I agreed. I had imagined she'd be more comfortable in a fancy boardroom or a posh bank, but she seemed content just shooting the breeze with me. Still, I couldn't shake off the slight awkwardness due to our age difference. As we sorted through my belongings, we ended up tossing out more stuff than we kept. She had strong opinions about my closet, and she didn't budge despite my pleas for mercy. She promised to take me shopping for some decent clothes once I got settled in New York, once we finished packing. There were more boxes than would fit in my car, but not quite enough for a moving van. I hoped she had arranged for a small truck, I set aside my laptop and a little inkjet printer to check on an eBay auction. We were just about to sit down for dinner when another surprise popped up. A delivery van pulled up in front of the house. Letitia and I watched as the driver, dressed smartly, hopped out with a clipboard. Are you Alan Simmons? He asked. I've got a delivery for you. Where do you want it? What in the world is this? I muttered, puzzled. It's from Mr. Ramon Jordan, the driver explained. Got space in the garage. The spot where Marcy's Volvo used to sit was now vacant. I pointed in that direction and nodded. I caught Letitia covering her mouth trying to stifle her laughter. I guess she found my confusion amusing. Five minutes later, I was staring at a sleek orange sports car parked next to my old Volvo. What the heck is this? I exclaimed with a hint of pride. The courier declared. This year's a 28 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider Superlogger, a model. Ain't she a beauty? Letitia could hardly contain her giggles. She wasn't making a scene, but it was clear she was thoroughly enjoying herself. I signed off on the delivery and watched the courier leave and his fancy get up. I had no clue what I'd do with my new gift, but one thing was for sure I wasn't lugging it all the way to New York. Miss Funny Pants here could keep her fancy wheels. My guest still had a smile plastered across her face as we drove off. I ordered up a full rack of ribs and a couple of brews here to fill me in on the deal with the car. I asked, curious, Ramon, what big on winter wheat? Everyone thought he was nuts as prices started to tank, but he doubled down on contracts and in less than a week, he raked in over $40 million. She explained he was pleased with the cash, but the compliments about his clever move made him even happier. Well, good for Ramon. Hope he didn't drop my name, I remarked. Apparently he wanted to give you credit, but only if you were cool with it. 
He thanked me for bringing you to the party and wanted your address. I didn't know he planned to do that, though. As the ribs arrived, I watched Letitia dunk a few into Tabasco sauce before digging in. Man, I adore that girl. You know I'll be sending this back tomorrow, right? I asked. That's what I figured. No worries. Ramon won't be offended. He would have offered the money outright, but he probably thought you'd decline. That way you'd feel more obliged to keep it. We had to order extra beers because of all that Tabasco. I was feeling good and didn't want the night to end. At that moment, I would have given anything to spend the night with this gorgeous young lady. I envied those smooth, charming guys who could charm any girl into bed in a heartbeat. All I could hope for was a good night kiss. We couldn't chat all night. So eventually I had to head home. The next morning was fantastic. Turns out all my worrying was for nothing. As soon as we stepped into the house, Letitia grabbed my hand and led me to the bedroom. Being the gentleman I am, I made sure to tend to her needs first. And in return, I was treated to the best night of passion in my secluded life. Breakfast in bed was simple juice, coffee, and Danish. Sorry, it's the best I can do under the circumstance, as I apologized. It's perfect, she assured me, although eating off a tray in bed isn't as comfy as it sounds. After a few laughs and some adjustments, we relocated to the kitchen. Breakfast in bed sounds fancier than it really is, Letitia. I chuckled. Not to spoil the mood, but I'm curious why you chose me. I don't have much to offer, and you deserve someone great. I've been burned by slick, charming lovers before. I won't fall for that again, she explained. I got it. You're into me because I'm not a player or a jerk, I replied. She found this amusing and chuckled. Alan... I was impressed with your deal with James in New York. She said, Just sold some coins, nothing major. I shrugged. I found your plan to buy trust land. Intriguing, she continued. Me, a philanthropist, not. I see myself as a cunning guy who took advantage of a unique situation to mess with his wife's lover. I smirked. She laughed at that, and I couldn't help but smile too. I was amazed at her intelligence and how well she kept it hidden. Was that a mistake on my part? No, Alan, that was brilliant. She reassured me her curiosity about me was piqued and she wanted to learn more. You couldn't possibly have known what I was up to in New York. I protested. True. When I found out later, she admitted you were checking up on me, weren't you? I realized I'm not naive. Admittedly, the boost to my self-esteem felt good. Unfortunately, Letitia had an early morning flight back to New York. Saying goodbye was tough. However, she left me feeling content and even entrusted me with the key to her apartment. The dealer couldn't pick up the Lamborghini until the next day, but that was fine since I had no intention of driving it. The movers arrived with a small truck to transport my belongings to New York. Terry Davis called with troubling news about Keystone Developments, financial woes. Clayton had lost most of its backers almost overnight, and rumors swirled about missing funds that evening. My almost ex-wife paid a surprise visit, so what do I owe this unexpected pleasure? I inquired. I need to talk to you about some things, she replied. I'm leaving in a few days, but I'll help you in any way I can. Noticing the absence of my old Volvo, Marcy questioned the orange car in the garage. Sorry, Marcy. I sold the Volvo back to the dealer after you said you didn't want it. As for the orange car, it was a gift, but I plan to return it tomorrow. I explained. Marcy was surprised by this term of affection. Curious about the expensive gift. She speculated if it came from my new girlfriend. No, it was a gesture of gratitude from a cattle rancher. I helped, I clarified as the conversation shifted. Marcy hesitated before asking about the money from the house sale. It's all gone, I admitted. You said you didn't want anything, so I used the money to set up my new apartment for the move. Marcy seemed puzzled, but accepted the explanation when asked about my destination. I disclosed my upcoming move to New York for a new job and a significant raise. However, I chose not to mention my plan to live with Letitia. I wasn't planning on spilling the beans about the Cayman bank account either. You never mentioned what happened to the apartment, she queried. It was just leased. The lease ran out and the owner didn't want to renew it, I clarified. So where are you living now? She inquired further. We're crashing at the Holiday Inn until Clayton finds us a new place, I informed her. I get it now, I remarked. Understanding Marcy's motives for wanting to move into our old house, she seemed a bit puzzled. I see, she responded, appearing unsure. It was evident she needed assistance, but was hesitant to ask. 
As the conversation paused, I offered, Is there anything else I can do for you? Marcy hesitated before requesting. Could you give me a ride to the Holiday Inn? The ride started smoothly, but then Marcy brought up my girlfriend. Tell me about her, she pressed. She's not exactly a girlfriend. More like a business partner, I explained. What kind of business? She probed. We're not into any business, to be honest. I'm just a clerk at the grocery store, I admitted. Marcy remained silent, gazing out the window and muttered bastard under her breath. At that moment, I had the perfect chance, to my frustration, to let her know how much those newspaper pictures hurt me. But instead, I chose to keep silent and smiled inwardly, seeing Marcy in distress. I felt a twinge of guilt, but it passed quickly as I dropped her off at the motel entrance. She departed without a backward glance or a goodbye, despite feeling a pain of regret, there was also a strange sense of satisfaction. Thursday morning brought an unexpected delivery, the final divorce papers. They arrived earlier than expected, but I wasn't complaining. On the front page of the Huntsville paper, there was a photo of Letitia Rothberg arriving at the airport, accompanied by her sincere friend. Each room at the Holiday Inn received a complimentary newspaper, so Marcy would undoubtedly stumble upon it during breakfast. I emptied the safety deposit box at the bank, ready to move forward. My seven pennies will definitely come in handy soon during Letitia's visit. I expected her to inquire about them, but she never brought it up. All our discussions were purely social. Now I'm bringing up the topic of the auction prices. More than half of the coins were sold at that price, so I spent the rest of the day packaging and getting them ready for shipment. The remaining auctions had to close by noon on Friday. If all the PayPal payments go through smoothly, I'll be able to mail out all the coins the same day. Any dubious buyers will have to wait until bright and early on Saturday morning. I hit the road. Most of the money from my PayPal account got transferred to my Cayman account. I kept a small amount on PayPal just in case I wanted to make an impulse purchase. As I was leading, the buyers of the house arrived, making it a win-win situation for both of us. The drive up north would take about 12 hours without any delays. Letitia was waiting in the apartment and promised to whip up a homemade dinner for my return. I wondered who would be cooking it. It was reassuring to know that I still had what it takes to capture the heart of such a stunning woman. I was confident I could meet all her expectations just as I was crossing into Virginia on Interstate 81. Cindy gave me a call. It turns out Clayton Manning had skipped town, leaving Marcy stranded without a car or a place to stay. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you have not already. Also, leave a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. If you have a tale to share with me regarding your own or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.